We're in Clearwater Beach at the Arbor's Jazz Fest, and my name is Monk Rowe. I'm very pleased to have Sherry Maracle with me today. And usually I say saxophonist somebody or, you know, keyboardist, but I'm not sure which to go first with you. I was looking at your, mm. your write-up, and I don't know how you handle your life. Well, I was hoping you could tell me <laughs> how I should identify myself. Yes. <laughs> it's been my problem let's, all along. Let's say a musician. Okay. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have a lot of different, different, uh, different things that I do, yeah. and, and every time I look back on my my career, I, I wonder if it's uh, it's it's always been really interesting to me, and I think kept me motivated, highly motivated um, mm -hmm. if, about music in general. But then sometimes I wonder, well, if I would have just picked one thing, would I have you know yeah. excelled to a higher level? I'm not. I don't know if I would have or not. I'm not right. sure. Because the way it is now, it's just a, it's every day is a, a thrill to be a musician. Mm -hmm. You seem to be one of the few people I've met who manages to balance a good deal of performing with the um, your educational obligations. Mm -hmm. would, would you say that's true? Yeah, sometimes it's a struggle to balance it, and that's yeah. pr probably the, the most um, major difficulty that I have. I'm lucky to be at a school, well, at New York University, that uh, right. well, part-time there, first of all, even though I direct a, the entire percussion program. Uh -huh. So, And there also the school seems to be flexible with their performing arts faculty. They see merit in us going around the world and mentioning that I, where I work. <laughs> right. You know, so Good. it attracts some students. Good. But that's but it's it's true. It's always a dilemma. Like if my one of my bands is is going on the road for ten weeks, then I have yeah. to hope that I can get out of my what to do with job. the students. Do you have subs yeah. you call in and yeah, I've only taken off actually one full semester from school mm -hmm. when uh, my band had about <clears throat> I think we had a twelve week tour and I but my boss I've been here for ten years just I I need to get out for a semester yeah and he let me go which is nice the old sabbatical right. Yeah, but I don't know if that's common for part-time people. Right. But anyway, right. He, he let me out, so good. that was good. Other times, it's yeah, a lot of a lot of well-qualified subs, which are easy to easy to find in New York. There's yeah. a lot of good players, teachers. Was Buffalo um, a oh, let's say fertile musical atmosphere to grow up in? Well, I actually grew up in uh, Endicott. New York, okay. but born in Buffalo, yeah. and I, I go to Buffalo at least a couple of times a year. Some of my, my friends are still there, and a lot of my family was still there, but where I grew up was a town called Endicott, New York, and, sure. that, and Binghamton, of course you know where that is, yeah. and that was that was amazing to grow up there. It was uh, well, Slam Stewart, the jazz bass player, lived there, right? and, and uh, every big band that there was came through came through town, Buddy Rich and Woody Herman and mm -hmm. Count Basie, and I, I saw... I saw all of those bands, and I was lucky to have a teacher that took me because when I was 11, a teacher took me to see Buddy Rich and his Killer Force Orchestra, and that was Ooh. when I was 11. That that really set. That's exactly what I wanted to do. Then was just play the drums, and I never changed ever from that. Wow. You know. So. You yeah anticipated a, a question mm -hmm. that I, oh, I did. Yes, if there was oh, a sorry. that's good mm -hmm. uh, a okay. uh, kind of pivotal moment when when you were young, seeing or hearing something. Yeah, actually, I remember. Uh, well, that was definitely set me right, right off in my direction, and I literally never, ever thought of anything else. I remember telling my eighth grade teacher, "I know exactly what I'm going to do, and I have to move to New York." And I mean, really, I remember wow. having this conversation with uh -huh. this guy when I was 12 years old. But prior to that, when you were first allowed to take musical instruments, I went to the fourth grade of whatever and went up to the teacher, and I want to play uh, the trumpet. No, girls don't play the trumpet. Here's a metal clarinet, and gave me this thing to squeak and squawk on, and I was horrible, and he was horrible, and I, I just was, I would quit. I was like, uh -huh. I don't want to play music. This is terrible. This teacher, you know, and then the teacher actually uh -huh. called the house. I think he was a little unsteady, uh, like unstable, and called my mother and said, she's so talented, and I was really, I was terrible. I mean, I, I could barely make a sound on this metal clarinet, <laughs> but he begged for me to be in the school band, so I went back, and then really somehow... I started on the cello and played that for like three years, and then desperately one one day someone needed someone to hit the bass drum, and I was like, I'll do it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> any chance to hit something. So I went back and played the bass drum, and then kind of just stuck with drums after that. Interesting. Yeah, and then, but then when I saw Buddy, that was that was uh, that was it. Mm -hmm. and, and at, at age eleven. Yeah. Yeah. 11. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's when you kind of started on the whole drum set. I actually uh, pleaded with my mother to buy me a drum set, which was like. There's just no way, you know. 
my daughter's not playing the drums kind of attitude. And this, uh -huh. But then, after my pleading and screaming, she, I remember she bought me a, I begged for a snare drum, which is the first drum you would get, and she came home, didn't, didn't know a drum from anything, and went to the music <laughs> store, and the guy told her, this is a snare drum, and of course, it was this big, like, funky, weird, brown tom-tom, and... Just the fact that she bought it for me, I, I, I t I've told her now, but I could never tell yeah. her for years it was the wrong drum. <laughs> so I'd be practicing on this tom-tom, and then I finally got into um, into drum set when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I was terrified to try out for the jazz band, and another good teacher said, actually said something like, are you, are you stupid? Just go ahead, you know, because there were, there were no girls in it. Yeah. There were no girls that ever played the drums anyway. Right. So he was encouraging. And we use something of, a, I don't want to use don't take this personal, mm -hmm. an oddity mm -hmm. in your school, being the girl stage band drummer, was that kind of like strange? Uh, probably being time? being a good one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. like, there's, I don't mean that in a conceited way, but I took I took it really seriously mm -hmm. since I, I knew that that's, that's what I wanted to do for a living. I was maybe more serious than other yeah. girls who were in the band playing other in instruments. Mm -hmm. I think like a, a lot of the women in my band have had similar experiences. They were very dedicated and very serious at a, at a pretty young age. You mm -hmm. know, I'm pretty passionate about it, so then am I, yeah. you know. Not, not, I wasn't weird with my other friends who were interested in pursuing the same okay. things, but they were all, all boys. <laughs> yes. Is there a, a teacher along the way that you credit with really helping you along this path? Uh, in, in Binghamton, which we were uh, talking about before, just the, the area itself, there was a guy named Al Hom who ran a lot of the jazz bands right. up there. I was going to ask about that. I, he, uh, I went I to, uh, first I started in college at SUNY Binghamton, the state university. Mm -hmm. or I started at Ithaca, then I finished at SUNY, and Al uh, liked the way I played, and I you know, subsequently went into all of his bands, and he booked a lot of the shows in Binghamton, and I, I, was, I played all the time there. It's like it was the best possible way to train to do anything in music, was mm -hmm. to be playing in his big bands and his small bands and uh, he introduced me to Slam Stewart and I played with Slam a lot and got to play on Slam's last album with him and uh, mm. Al introduced me to a lot of people and gave me unbelievable amounts of opportunity. Every ice capades uh, came through town, every show, I played percussion for all of them. Mm -hmm. So it was phenomenal. So that phase of my life, but r really uh, somebody who opened my eyes unbelievable to music was Stanley, uh, Stanley K when I came to New York. and. Uh -huh. um, 1986 and met him a few years later and he he's like a to me a, a genius and like so inspirational to me mm -hmm. and just about music the music business about drumming about jazz about big band playing and really you know because he's he was he's the drummer with Josephine Baker Patty Page and Frankie Lane of course Buddy Rich is assistant drummer and he managed the Buddy Rich band for 30 years so it's ironic that I my business partner and like my best friend Stanley would, was probably with Buddy in Binghamton when I was 11. Oh, neat! Like watching that, yeah. you know, and not realizing that there was this uh, silly girl like staring in awe. Did your mother w ever? Uh, well, I shouldn't say ever. Did, at what point did she become adjusted to the idea that you were going to become a professional musician? Well, I think when when she you know she would. She didn't come to all the high school performances, but some of them. And I, I think when I, I won't say when I, when I started to make money, but when I was, um, you know, when she heard people clapping. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, and she's like, oh, people's my daughter. Oh, yes. <laughs> but I, my, the funniest thing was um, in New York when I got to sub in my first Broadway show, which is a good aspiration for musicians. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a good job and everything, and it's fun. So I was subbing for one of my friends on the stage part to a, the cabaret revival. Which was, I think it was an '89, and with, with Joel Gray, the last a few years ago, and I, so it's my the very first time I've ever done it. I have to memorize the music, so I, they wheel the all-girl band in their you know fishnet stockings and their skimpy little sequins costumes out on the stage, and I and looking in the fourth row, and it's my mother going like this, like waving, and I'm like, oh my God, this is this is not uh, Binghamton <laughs> High School. Stop it, <laughs> you know, sinking yeah. in horror. Right, poking this, the people next to her. Yeah, that's my daughter. This is New York. This is Broadway. Don't even, you know, it was embarrassing. That's but, a nice but, story, but though. But cute. Yeah. Yeah, but it was cute. But I think now, of, of course, she's you know she's happy. But I think it was a big adjustment. She was always. Mm -hmm because she didn't understand anything about it. She's like, please study computers, please study computers. That's what she always said to us. Yeah. Isn't that interesting where, where your musical genes come from? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I really grew up in a country and western household. That's all oh. my mom listens to. And, uh, really? 
mm -hmm. likes Irish folk music too. Her family, there are a lot of Irish mm -hmm. relatives. I like that also. But every every single morning we woke up and one of those two styles of music was blaring through the house. And I just remember, I remember also being a kid and spinning the dial <clears throat> on my radio one night in bed. I couldn't sleep and accidentally twirled down to uh, WSKG Public Radio in Binghamton. And I remember the song. It was a uh, Booker Irvin's version of The Lamp is Low. And mm -hmm. I heard that, and I was like, "What? What is that?" And it was mm -hmm. it was jazz, and I I didn't know what it was, and I really really liked it. So I was just that was an accident too. Yeah. I mean, my mother wouldn't have known like where to even look for a jazz radio station, or you know, she just it wasn't her interest. So I found that by accident. Uh -huh. and so you know, along with learning the different instruments, would be bugging my teachers, and they they gave me a lot of recordings, and so I just automatically loved it. I think everybody does that goes into jazz. I don't think any single, like I don't think it's a, a study or like a really even a choice. I really, I really don't think it's a choice. I think you're right. I, th yeah. I think one, <laughs> one fellow described it as an illness. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you you'd, be, you'd be insane to pick it as an yeah. art field, you know, or a career. Uh -huh. I mean, and I have at parents sometimes at like parent teacher days or career day at yeah. college, you know, mm -hmm. you know, excuse me, uh, what's the starting salary for a jazz musician? And you just have to say, um, not, you know, ma'am, mm -hmm. it's a great benefit package with that also, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, that's like an oxymoron, <laughs> starting salary for a jazz musician, I, I know. guess. Or any musician. So then in the role yeah. of, of teacher, sometimes I see a, a really such unbelievable talent in the students. And I'm, even from the time I've lived in New York, and just see the, the change in the, the face of jazz there with um, the shutdown of clubs. And I played for eight years at the Village Gate, which was a great club on Bleecker Street, every every single Saturday. I can't, I mean, I had this, I got this job like the second year I lived in New York and I had it for, for eight years just playing with my own trio. Oof. And it was a jam session, it was four hours. It was like unbelievable training for me, you know, speaking uh -huh. to an audience and just, you know, playing all the time. And then that club closed and they used to have jam sessions. The Blue Note had a jam session every night, except Monday, every night till 4 a.m because I used to go when I first moved in. Uh, there's all these loads of opportunities to play. The Village Vanguard was $5. You could see Mel Lewis's band. Uh -huh. Now the cost is astronomical to go to anywhere. And the students are, you know, they're, they're struggling. There's nowhere for them to play. You know, like there's no outlets yeah. for them. Well, I mean, it was something I was going to ask you about, especially being uh, one of the things you do with the IAJE. Mm -hmm. um, I attended the the festival in January, and it was breathtaking almost to, to see the amount of people and, and everybody there. But I wondered, is it translating down to that level of places to play and jam sessions and all that kind of thing? It's like, it's, a, it's, it's very bizarre, but I, I can't remember who I was speaking with uh, some, maybe somebody at IAJ, but some very uh, other, you know, um, musicians, and they were saying the, the place of the, the jazz artist is really going into academia yeah. now and into the colleges. And you can, you can tell, by the way, the students play. It's so, it's so interesting that it's, I won't say cookie cutter, because there's all the kids, certain, certain ones have different talents, but there's so much information about how to learn Mm -hmm. So much information and so little innovation, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, what, and what the new, new artists, right. young artists are doing. It's either duplicating uh, what was styles or, you know, attitudes or whatever you call mm -hmm. it, if artists that came before them or else it's everybody trying to play like John Coltrane. Or it's, and you can really easily because a lot of what he did or Charlie Parker, it's, or a lot of the drummers or pianists, it's all in a book. You can open a book and go, oh, here's track number seven from, you know, the Milestones <laughs> album. Oh, okay. Let me see what, how to, and they learn stuff that way. They, it's, so everything is getting so high and proficient uh, with like harmony and their te mm -hmm. technique and every, everybody like has all this information and knows all this and that and there's nowhere to go with it except mm -hmm. in school. There's like no, there's no jobs and, and nobody uh, has the opportunity to, to, to play all the time and create their own yeah. like uniqueness. It's all in the context of the school and I find that, that odd because you, you, you're never, it takes a really long time to get to get players to uh, to loosen up and, and open up and know, and when they're playing like in, in my big band I see it all the time which has a lot of young young women in it and it's 
you don't have to play all those things that you learned in school, all those fen phenomenal licks and all those mm -hmm. chord substitution. Nobody cares. Wh why you're going to make a living playing jazz is if you make somebody's heart go thump it a thump it a thump, mm -hmm. and you sit there. And I st always trying to say, what what moves you guys? And I was talking to about, about it last night with a, a knot, one of our tenor players. And cause she's brilliant, and I was saying, and she's got all the chops and technique in the universe. But just to get her to go like, honk, ba da da, and like play something in the audience, yay! If she plays something interesting, that's not like diddly diddly diddly. Look, look how fast I can play, you know. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares, you know. I'm so pleased to hear you say what? that. Actually, oh, you know, good. I mean, no, I don't, I don't really care am, either. Because uh, the, as you say, jazz is now have, has become academic and. Uh, there are so many different ways to explain what people did, and then you can just absorb it and, and do it, I guess. And of course, time goes by, you know, and things change. But when you talk to the the, the older veterans, they mm -hmm. learned on the street and they learned in the jam session, and they don't didn't seem to need all that instruction. Yeah, and you, you wish that people could have ch chances to do that now. Yeah. I mean, even in my, you know, when I was first learning, I would go to all those jam sessions, and I did, and I would go every night. And although it was sometimes a struggle as a woman, I mean, mm -hmm. I, this uh, person that ran the Blue Note jam session went, would never let me play. And then one time he said, well, you can play if you take your shirt off. Then later he would say, oh. all right, honey, well, you can play it, but here's the tempo, and it would be some real slow ballad. So then he would let me play ballads for a couple of nights, and then I, mean, I rarely got to play. But, but you'd learn a lot. <laughs> so, like, you're always overcoming that st yeah. stupidity one also, but just, just to be in the in that environment, and um, yeah. you know, you, like you see all diff your peers, and then sometimes I remember at one jam session, I was I was at the uh, Jazz Coalition, and I was sitting there, and it was all night, and I was dying to play. Like I and I, but it got like really late. And it was about quarter to two, and I was like, oh, they're not going to ask me to play. It's too late. So I had, um, I think I had three beers or something, and mm -hmm. I was like, oh. This, and then the music was all great, so I was happy. And then they, then I hear my name, Sherry Miracle, like. Oh no, because I, I didn't want to. And, and I went up to play, and it was with John Hendricks, the singer, who just happened to be there. And it's a great bass player, Jamil Nasser, and Harold Mayburn, a great pianist. And, uh, this, and, I, and I remember John Hendricks wanted to play Cloudburst, you know, and it was so <laughs> fast. And here I am riding on three beers, like in a half an hour or something. And it was all like, I mean, I was, yeah. you know, grateful to the bass player. Help me. <laughs> you know? But I, oh. so it taught me a lesson, you know. Uh -huh. Soda pop, so you, know, you can never drink a speck ever mm -hmm. and, try to, and attempt to play. You better be ready ever. when your moment comes, huh? Yeah, that was funny. That was oh. a good lesson. Who was the hmm? who was the guy who was was that the fellow running the jam session who who was so uh, patronizing to you? Yeah, well, it was yeah. Ted Curson. I don't I don't mind saying who it is. Oh yeah, the trumpet okay. player Ted Curson. Yeah, and he, I'm sure it was, it was an event that he wouldn't remember. To him, it was probably just a, a silly off, you know, comment like teasing a, yeah. a teasing a young woman, killing you know, a teasing a young woman. Do you know Holly Hoffman? Uh, yes. Yeah, she told me a very very similar story. Really? Yeah, by a jam session situation. Well, it's it's yeah. it's funny. It happens with with uh, diva. Also, will go to a venue and people. I mean, people have actually said things to us as stupid as, well, even the professional bands don't do this. You know, meaning if we question their sound system or something. So you just look at at oh. them with what, and then, then uh, of course the band plays, and then they're they're on. Then usually the people become almost apolo apologetic for mm -hmm. their stupidity. You know, once they hear the band. Yeah. Another known musician recently said, "God, you guys sound so great, almost like a real band." So you just look at them like, hmm. Oh, uh, and then they try to back you know backpedal. Uh -huh. I didn't mean that. It's like okay. And so it's always, uh, it's really its really interesting, and it's so funny. I mean, it's not funny. It's so, it's common how slow, you know, mm -hmm. the, the stuff that's socially ingrained in people's mind about, you know, what women do and what men do, yeah. even though it just takes so long to change it, you know. If it ever will change, I don't know. Do you think people would, um, I'm not sure how to even ask this. How would it change the look uh, or the perception of your band if there was like three men in it? Uh, well, we have, I've had some men play with us yeah. <laughs> sometimes just by uh -huh. nature of uh, the band is at you know the highest professional level and there aren't yeah. enough women to right. fill the chairs sometimes uh -huh. so it's not a not a problem okay. with us but like the um, 
there's always the you know the argument of well if, if you're all so good why do you have to play with each other <laughs> you know which is kind of in, in, insulting you know it's like well you know then why don't you force and I, I don't agree with the issue of like forcing women there was a big article in the paper about trying to force Wynton Marcellus to hire women or something and I oh. I don't agree I, I don't necessarily agree with forcing the issue and I know that a lot of bands operate on you know these are the people we like to play with because it's such a collective art form and you can't apply the same laws of, of labor to music and say mm. well you have to have this has to be your split you know you know three afro-americans three women you know two yeah. hispanic you can't there's no way uh -huh. it has to be the people you like to work with and the people you have gel with the best in your art or it's not going to be the it's not going to be the same band mm -hmm. But when we formed Diva, when Stanley it was Stanley Kay's idea, and he, I played with him, and he managed Maurice and Gregory Hines, and it was a concert with Maurice, and I was just hired to play drums, and he liked the way I played, and it was fantastic music. And it was a couple of years later, he called me up and said, "Hey, do you know women that play as good as you do?" <laughs> Which uh, to me was his, uh, unbelievable because he was Buddy Rich's manager. I'm like, uh -huh. Buddy, I said, I said, yeah, and I thought, wow, he was so serious, and I could tell it wasn't any. There's, there was no BS in his tone about trying to form a T and A band or anything, which uh -huh. so many of the bands were. And I, I would, I, I played in one in New York sometimes to, put, to like an old woman band, a wedding type band, a club yeah. date band, to you know to make money. And I would see myself included, but I would see my friends that were so good, like unbelievable musicians, in there on a consistent basis. And I was used to feel so bad, like, mm. why does that woman have to wear a mini dress? to play alto saxophone when she's the best, she's a great, great player. And she was just like not getting where she needed yeah. to be. Yeah. Well, anyway, so that was one of my motivations by listening to Stanley and you know knowing how serious he was and all his, his influence and connections in music. And I thought, good, because I, I always, my dream was to be in Woody Herman's band. And then that went by the wayside yeah. and Woody passed away. And would, so I was like, I, big band is always, my big band and trio are my two favorite kinds of drumming. Mm. So I, I was like, yeah, I'd love to be have any, anything to do with a big band. And I originally wasn't the leader, but <clears throat> I was, you know, in there and helped with the original personnel and uh -huh. got the women, you know, women together. And it was really interesting because, like what we were saying uh, prior to this was, where was I, you know, looked at as weird as being the only girl drummer. Well, everybody in the band probably had a similar experience of, there's that girl that can play. There's that good girl trumpet player. There's like every single person. So then all of a sudden you're in Diva and everybody plays really great. Mm. So then the first band, it was so funny because I think it really knocked out of whack some of the egos that were like, I'm unique, I'm unique. I'm a woman jazz artist, I'm unique. Oh. And suddenly nobody's unique. And they were all like, oh, uh oh, I'm sitting next to five other people who play just as good as I do, who are my same gender. I'm not unique anymore. So it was really, really interesting. I guess to see what happened. Unexpected to, to see yeah. what happened in the band and everybody like kind of fighting for their their uh -huh. solos and their space and everything. The band is now is not just after you know since 1992 yeah. is not like that anymore. It's a lot okay. more, a lot more evolved, you know. But it's and now and now the the purpose of the band is still. Uh, it's not like a huge bold feminist statement because most of it, it is in one respect, but for us it's a. It's great music for mm -hmm. us, us to play at a really high level, and it's uh, and we have it's amazing when you have so many fans all over the all, all over the world, literally. And it's it's funny to go someplace and you hear people like screaming stuff from your CDs, and oh. I mean they just really love the band mm -hmm. and they they love the music, and and they love the way we play yeah. it. They can identify like a sound with our our band. Uh -huh. You know, after a, a relatively short period of time, you know, seven years basically, we've been working seven or eight. Wow. And is it a, um, is it hard to coordinate everybody's schedule? I mean, years alone, mm -hmm. but to get everybody together for rehearsals and to play gigs? Yeah, I, th I think uh, people make it a, a priority because uh -huh. they, they like it. And as we were saying before, there's not a, a, a load, loads of places where you can get a chance to express yourself. Yeah playing jazz. A lot of people in the group play Broadway shows. A lot of them play in wedding bands. Some have mm -hmm. their own bands, but they, you know, the, the clubs in New York that play for the door or, you yeah. know, then you make three dollars a night. I mean, that's still, that's still, there's still fun jobs to do, but mm -hmm. that's, I find that still amazing that people can play for the door. But um, yeah, they, they make Diva, I, I think, I think a priority and everybody's pretty dedicated to it. Mm -hmm. Our lead trumpet player recently joined the army 
She's the only the first woman lead trumpet player wow. in a military band. She's in the Army Blues Band. Neat. Yeah, so she's we're having trouble getting her. Out, yeah. But once in a while she can she can get free. Well, when you when you go to uh, these high school competitions now, it's very common to see um, more girl saxophone players than guys mm -hmm. in the sections. And, uh, yeah, a lot. My own daughter plays trumpet, and you know, so she's not mm -hmm. by herself back there all the time either. Uh, we were recently in Iowa, and I, we saw uh, Lisa and I went ahead of time to adjudicate a high school festival. There's uh, 20 bands. Most of them were, were girls. Yeah. Like in every band, almost every every. There's like one one uh, band had one boy playing tenor, all girls. Is that right? Yeah, but they the women somehow still young girls don't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. It's very rare still. I think that somebody says, I think I'll make jazz my career. Yeah. And go off and study it. It still doesn't seem like an option that. Is really open for for women. Yeah. For some reason, it's just not even laid out in front of them. Mm -hmm. Here, you can do this, you can do that, you can do this, or be a jazz musician. It's not like, <laughs> right. not like a very common. But yeah. I, I think one thing that that Diva does, which is great, is certainly role models for the young women that if the, that they want to take it seriously, that mm -hmm. yes, there is hope. And the second yeah. thing is for any for any any students, uh, we're the only big band that a lot of kids have ever seen live uh -huh. and it's incredible that, that they like barrel to the stage you know in, in colleges too some the kids say we never saw a big band before <clears throat> you know and it's so they don't mm. care if we're men women or martians they just mm -hmm. are so excited that it's a big band and they never heard you know this kind of a sound live yeah. you know which it's, it's that's it's, it's to me it's so sad because it is it's expensive to move a it's mm -hmm. expensive to move a big band but it's 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 really not as um prohibitive is certainly not any rock bands but then you're of course dealing with the drawing power and yeah. or even a band an artist like uh, you know the heavy heavy hitting jazz stars which could get command fortunes and fortunes of money you know for yeah. trios and things like that but and it's it's well deserved but it's just too mm -hmm. bad that some of it it it's really seems impossibly difficult now to be building new artists and it trickles down from you know the media to the record companies to the agents whom I deal not well. Stanley, our manager, deals with me on a you know once in a while, and through Stanley is nobody seems to have any desire in in like building a new artist up. It's like we'll give you a record deal, but you have to be famous first. It's the kind of thing. Like we'll uh -huh. uh, we'll we'll book you on a tour, but you have to have gigs first. Like some bizarre. You have to prove to us that you you have a tour already, then we'll book you on a tour. <laughs> it's like some bizarre uh -huh. sort of like nobody's willing to invest in. Uh -huh. It's like it's that's one thing I learned from Stanley that it's the music business and the business part of any business, new business, you have to invest in it, you know. And he's, yeah. I mean, you, you have to. There's so many new bands, and in New York alone, you can go to, you know, any given day, you can go to probably 10 big band rehearsals somewhere uh -huh. and hear some great music and some yeah. awful music, some great music with some phenomenal players, and they go, Here's, here's my band, and then they, they don't realize all the stuff that you're gonna have to pay for. You know, once oh. once things get rolling, they just think, I formed a big band, here's my 10 charts, send me on a tour, you know, and then mm. that's, and they all might very well deserve it, but yeah. it's, it's a hard, hard business. Like, I've heard uh, some complaints, mostly from what I'd have to describe as middle age white players, mm -hmm. that the record companies um, these days, if they're going to back up somebody, it's most likely going to be somebody pretty young and black. Mm -hmm. is, is that any truth to that statement, do you think? Well, uh, uh, well, thinking of the two biggest singers breakthrough, Harry, Harry Connick and of the you know, recent decade and Diana Krall, yeah. and this new woman that's being pushed pretty hard, Jane Monheit, they're right. all white. That's true. <laughs> um, no, there's, I can think of some uh, Jackie Terrason, I can think of some young white artists. Uh -huh. in the, but yeah, middle. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to. You look at records. There's even here at this festival. There's, you know, hundreds of records downstairs with with phenomenal players. Mm -hmm. But it's. I think it's. Uh, I don't. I don't understand how like media and marketing works. But you can take any any musician, and I'm sure if you dump enough advertising into them, they're going to have a little flicker of of fame. Like. Uh -huh. As great as Diana Krall is, who I, I love her, happen to be a really big fan of hers. I love the way she plays. I think she's great. But I know uh, some other players who do similar things and who are her same age, who play unbelievable piano and sing their brains out. 
Now I was thinking some record person could have taken this other artist, for example, and just put all that time, money, and effort in it and come up mm -hmm. with an equally great product. So mm -hmm. I don't know who, who, why it's lucky, who gets, who gets yeah. picked. But I, think, I do think in Europe, and I, I have experienced some of the um, promoters there really being in love, in love with that, that look of you know, young, handsome, black men in suits, you know, dancing yeah. a lot. And I mean, I've heard them say things like this, like uh, only, only Americans can play. And it's always the women. I've never heard a, ma um, a male promoter say this. Oh. Women, and there's a lot of women pr promoters there who talk like that. They think that that means that it's jazz, you know? For some reason, there's a mm -hmm. certain look that they're going for okay. that people identify quickly, you yeah. know? And it might not be a middle-aged guy with a pot belly, or it might not be 15 <laughs> women, I don't know. Right. <laughs> But I tell you, just a, one brief story. Uh -huh. we, when we were playing at Tavern on the Green in New York, they used to have a great jazz room there. Mm -hmm. And the, the, it was a Jazz Times convention, and about I think about 15 of the European promoters were all from all the big festivals, North Sea and Pori and Perugia. They were all here. So Stanley said to the Tavern on the Green, I'm going to bring all these European guys here. Give us the room for the happy hour. Diva's going to play a concert and give them a cocktail hour or something. Yeah. So they said, all right. So we did a concert for all these. They All of them came with their friends and guests and families. And afterwards, and there was a, a guy with a camera from Norway or something, and he's talking to me, and this fella said, you're going to come to Europe this summer for eight weeks. You're going to be here for the whole festival season. We all love you. You're going to have all these gigs. This is great. And drinking, drinking, drinking. I was like, wow, this is terrific. We got one concert. We played in Pori, Finland, and I asked the guy, Yerki Kenkas, his name is the producer. I said, what happened? I said, why did, not that we, we were happy we got the one gig, but yeah. I said, why, we're, we're over here, and it's so common for all the festivals to share. Mm -hmm. I mean, they share the airline expense, and that's oh. the, huge, yeah. the huge expense of uh, getting anybody over to Europe for this, because they, you know, they all overlap, so it's perfect for artists to go from one to the other. And he said to me, well, uh, they, they heard you play, and they liked it, but when they woke up, and they thought it was great, but when they woke up in the morning, they, they realized they were drunk and that you're only women, so it couldn't have been as good as they thought. And that's what he told me, and he was there. I mean, he obviously hired us, but he couldn't convince the other promoters to hire us for that, and that was the reason wow. he told me. You know, and I was like, all right, good. <laughs> But I mean, it hasn't held us back from, from okay. Europe. We have a good agent uh -huh. now, and we've been there, you know, dozens of times and played a lot of the great festivals, but just not. Jeez. We've done a lot of one nighters in Europe one night in Berlin, home, one night in Rome, home, one night. We, oh, we, wow. we finally went to, we went for, to Europe for uh, five weeks in the fall. We went all over the place. It was a really nice tour, a lot mm -hmm. in Germany, and uh, we went to Croatia and Turkey and Russia and went all over. That was fun. But finally, we got a good a good agent. But mm -hmm. she's saying, it, yeah, somehow it's still it's hard to hard to sell because they're afraid it's not going to be good. They think it's going to be a you know women in tight dresses like so, playing kind of a week. novelty thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, we played a, a long Midwest tour, and the, this guy sent me an article he wrote in the paper, and it said. The last thing I wanted to do on Saturday night was go hear some all girl band play a watered down version of In the Mood. That was the t that was how his article started. Then he went, "Oh my God, I was so wrong." And then he just went on to say like how uh, mm -hmm. how his just his preconception of what women musicians were like, you know, stopped him from even wanting to go. He's like, "My wife had to drag me by the ear," and <laughs> you know, but, and that's also a neat thing. Like a lot of the women, older women from you know like sixty on up. You know, sometimes they'll they'll come to the stage. Like, I played trumpet in fifth grade, uh -huh. and this is so great. And we're so happy uh -huh. to see women. You know, and like the you know old, older women get really like turned on too, and they're happy to see women doing something right. that they didn't necessarily see in their generation. Yeah. Have you ever seen those films of the uh, international sweetheart, sweethearts of mm -hmm. rhythm? Is that what it was called? Yeah. 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 Interesting concept. And and the Sherry Tucker's new book. I don't know if you've read that called Swing Shift. It's one of the best books I've ever read. It's, I think I have that book. It's, yeah. a, it's a history of the women's swing bands from the 30s and 40s. Oh. I've never read a better researched book in my life. Mm. I, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's horrifying, actually, how women are left out of history. I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. I've cited this example to a million people, but there was a band called the Darlings of Rhythm, and this is from Sherry's book, that played at the Apollo Theater more than any other band. And <laughs> it, it was either 1944 or 1946. And in the book, The History of the Apollo, they're not even mentioned once as even having ever played there. Just as, a, as an example of how they were completely ignored. Oh, they're only women. They're not, they're mm -hmm. not important. They're not a real band. Let's not even mention them. Yeah. But apparently there were hundreds of bands, and it's oh. 
we recently um, did a, a thing to honor women, uh, uh, Nancy Wilson, Clara Bryant, Jane Jarvis, with Diva, and our, we're sponsored by a vodka company called Grey Goose Vodka. So mm -hmm. they, we did this charity event for Dress for Success, and Clara Bryant came. She's a trumpet player from Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Do you know her well? No, yeah. I don't know her well, but I know the name. <clears throat> well, I, I only knew her. She can't play anymore, and I just knew her as that, that woman used to play trumpet. And she's an amazing personality, like great personality, and she sent us some video of her. And I started crying when I saw her videotape. She was so, so great, like on the par easily with Dizzy Gillespie and mm. like Louis Armstrong kind of combination, sang her her brains out, danced, and I really, I really started to cry. I was like, why isn't this woman just like in the history book next to all these other guys? Because here she is, like probably one of the first uh, Afro-American women ever on, on television as much. She was on like a lot of the big TV talk shows, playing the, playing the trumpet, she was like dancing. She, and, and I saw it and I said, it's so weird that, you know, me like crawling towards 40, you know, and studying jazz my whole life, hardly know any of the, uh, Right. Women. I mean, I yeah. I had no clue that she played this good, or to be so so stupid that I didn't know women that in that day could play like that. I mean, that's a stupid thing to say, but it's so mm -hmm. undocumented that's really hard to find information. Yeah, you have to assume that nothing was happening because there's nothing there to uh, tell you about it. Right, and then you see these you know little things like that come out, and you're like, oh, and then you feel bad that it, I don't I don't know how it would have changed anything ab about the way I grew up, you know, in studying jazz, mm -hmm. except maybe it would have been great to see somebody, an instrumentalist, somebody besides a singer, mm -hmm. being considered a woman in jazz. It might have, you know, it might have encouraged a lot more women to go into it or something. Yeah. I don't know. What um, inspired you to pursue your education all the way through a doctoral degree? Well, I, this is this is a this will sound. It's not lame, but <laughs> I when I, I just wanted to move to New York. I didn't. Uh -huh. I didn't have any thoughts. Like I never even thought about going to graduate school. And I was at SUNY Binghamton. Uh, the, there was a concert there, and the ba a bassist Michael Moore was the bass player, and I loved the way he played. And first, my first thought was, if I ever get to make a CD, I'm going to ask him to play with me, mm -hmm. which I did. But I was saying to him, I'm going to move to New York next year, and you know, any hints like what should I do? And he said. Well, I teach at this school, NYU. I, I really didn't, I, I, didn't, I don't even think I heard of NYU. I'm like, oh, do they have a music department? He said, yeah, why don't you go check it out? So I, I called and I went down. I was like, that might be an okay way to like slide into New yeah. York with just, instead of just going cold. So I, I auditioned and got in and I really didn't like it. It was not a, not a strong department. So I was going to, uh, I was going to leave and just live in New York. And they said, but wait, we're going to give you a graduate scholarship. Uh, and then, then I got my master's degree, and then the, they hired a new program director, and the, the, the department started to get better. And then I was done, and they said, we don't want you to go. We're going to give you a doctoral fellowship. So when you don't have any money or a job, it's hard to turn down free school and a little right. salary. So that's maybe not the best. I didn't have, like, high academic mm -hmm. aspirations. but So, so I mean, that's why I, I finished uh, all my doctoral coursework. And, it, and I'm embarrassed to say I was my full 10 years of not writing my dissertation, then had to go into the maximum amount of extensions just because I wouldn't write it. I just could, I can, I function much better under pressure and deadline. Yeah. So I was at the thing, if, if I didn't write it, my whole classwork was going to get wiped out. Wow. So that's why I finished it. You had to get desperate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I didn't, you know, because there's, there's, I could, kept thinking, like, what do I need it for? But I, yeah. I didn't, uh, I, you know, I, I've never, uh, I'm never a quitter, so I knew that I, yeah. I I knew I would make myself. What write was your it. dissertation on? I um, I wrote well. For, I analyzed. Uh, it's a history of the percussion concerto, so mm -hmm. uh, solo solo percussion in orchestra. So I did a big history of that. I analyzed the concerto by Darius Mio, which is basically the first one for percussion mm -hmm. in orchestra. Then I wrote a concerto, <clears throat> and uh, analyzed that. Did a performance guide, and there you have it. Yeah. Nice thing to put you to sleep by. <laughs> And somebody, somebody at NYU recently came and said, I checked out your dissertation. I'm like, oh, <laughs> enjoy it as much as I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I, so it wasn't really like uh, having lofty goals to be mm -hmm. a, a professor or anything. I just, I, I wanted, you know, I, just, I thought I would be ridiculous not to finish yeah. it. And it right. also had always mo motivates me from having, be, teaching there and becoming friends with my, my doctoral committee and working with them. Mm -hmm. and, Professionally, that will you know they're going to really think I'm a jackass if I don't finish this. So I didn't oh. want to I didn't want to look like a 
uh -huh. a quitter, and I'm, I'm not. It's just I work better under pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole other side of your career, um, part of it is a, as a composer. Mm -hmm. um, when you started composing, did you find a need to have keyboard skills? Or how did, you know, usually we think of, of a drummer, unless they go out of their way to get all the harmony study, is, is maybe not having that as much. Yeah, well, you have to, st it's a requirement in school to learn mm -hmm. how to play the piano. And when yeah. you go into a jazz program, you have to take jazz piano as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I'm horrible. I can't play the piano, but I can play it as a as a writer. You know, I can okay. figure out my own chords and I can play through yeah. a passage, like in slow motion, <laughs> uh -huh. until I learn it. But um, and certainly, I've studied harmony and theory, mm -hmm. like inside out, to, you know, enough to make you sick. And uh, yeah. but I, you know, why I started writing, and this is also funny. I, my um, well, Al Ham, the person from Binghamton, I, he took me to a. He was playing at some saxophone workshop or something like that, and I was like, I'll, I'll go. He said, I'm playing this new music, so I went to hear the concert, and I went to several performances that day, and I could not stand any of it. And I, I, this is how stupid I was. I said, that music is so horrible, I bet I could write something better than that. So, I, I, so the first thing I wrote was a, mm -hmm. this four-movement suite for percussion and saxophone for Al, and we played it, and, I was, and it came out really good. So I was like, oh, I, I can kind of do this, too. Uh -huh. So I had... Uh, I don't mean it to sound like that sounds like ego, like egomaniacal, but it, I, for <laughs> some reason it, I don't mean it that way. I just was thinking, geez, I, I even I could try something better than this, you know. And it could have been, you know, boom chick, boom chick, and I, I probably would have liked it better. But it came out then, then doing uh, jazz jazz composition and arranging is a lot to yeah. me. It's a, it's a never, a never, never, never ending, you know, study. It's so to me, it's so uh, it's complicated. It's very sophisticated, and there's so many. There's so many high standards and people to idolize as writers. And if, mm -hmm. you know, somebody that I love, Tommy Newsom is a great writer. Yeah. Writes a lot for my band. Right. We're so blessed to have nice him. Nice charts. And, yeah, and the things you can study now in arranging with uh, uh, Bob Brookmeyer's music and Thad Jones. And, it's, and again, there's the other thing where it's, it's all, those guys just invented what mm -hmm. they did. And for me, I just go to a book and go, oh, here's Thad Jones voicing on the G7 chord. Okay, I'll steal that. Put it on me. <laughs> You know, yeah. so I don't have to think as hard as they did. I can just steal things from their from the books. Uh huh. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? How mm -hmm. the amount of information available there's some kind of ratio to uh, innovation, I guess. Mm. It almost doesn't make it easier because there's so much there. I I, I can't even finish my thought, but mm -hmm. I, I guess. Uh, I almost long for some of the old days when, when things just seemed to be more spontaneous or right. from the heart. And you could hear a player, and you would in a second you'd know who it was. Mm -hmm. You'd know instantly if it was Louis Armstrong or Clark Terry or, you know, the difference between uh, Dexter Gordon or Lester Young or whatever. I mean, you could and Johnny Hodges and Phil Wood, something totally extreme. But you could always. You could tell right away without even, you don't, now, what we were saying before, especially with the younger players, it's you listen and to, I, I would, if I took a, a blindfold test on new players, I'd, I'd completely fail. I would have no idea, like, mm -hmm. how to identify, except by tune, if you know someone's tune, but uh -huh. not by their soloing style, necessarily. Yeah. So much of it sounds the same. Well, what kind of advice do you give people like that? When people, well, well young students, uh, and that are just beginning to improvise, I always tell them, and I, and I mean, this is true for everyone. It's, it's not just all the notes. Yeah, that's an important to know what the chord is and, you know, know, you know, what scale goes with your chord and that, yes, you can play it all in eighth notes and you can probably play it in 30-second notes really fast, mm -hmm. up and down. I said, but that's, that's not really a good solo, is it? And they're all like, no. So, well, what's going to make your solo good? <laughs> you know, and they, I think, uh, well, certainly concentrating on, on rhythm for really young players and how to, you know, you can pick one note and play it in a really swinging rhythm, and that's going to be a better solo than playing 5,000 notes, mm -hmm. just blah, 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 you know, and, uh, and also trying to, I said, you could play something totally weird, just like that, just think of something emotional, like think of an emotion and, and play it through your horn, you know, if oh. you want to angry, like just play it. I had one 
girl on her tenor saxophone trying to play a low B flat. I'm like, come on, we're playing a B flat blues. I was like, just honk on a B flat, just go honk, like as loud as you can for like two measures. And she did it, and all her bandmates were cheering. And because meanwhile, she was trying to play like da 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 da. You know, it was her solo before, and I'm like, nah, that's, that's that's not a solo. I said, pick one of those notes and just play it. But you know, and that's just to start a, to start a kid out. But I think that it, I actually think it translates to a to people who are at a really sophisticated level of technique and harmonic mm -hmm. knowledge too. It's like nobody really, I mean, I don't, I fall asleep after like one chorus of being impressed with, wow, they have amazing chops. Wow, listen to that. Ooh, listen to that harmony. But it's, it's usually the same rhythm. It's all like, da -da 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 all like constant eighth notes forever mm -hmm. with, wow, how impressive your chops are. Then after like the fourth chorus, you're, you're, you know, it's like, <clears throat> it's like when somebody t talks in your face, like I'm doing to you nonstop, <laughs> you know, but with no inflection or anything, uh -huh. just like, you know, and you look like nonstop like this forever, the same exact t timbre to everything. And that's what some people's solos start sounding like, even though what I'm saying might be incredibly brilliant, but I'm mm -hmm. saying it all exactly the same way. Right. So that's yeah. like an analogy that I, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think applies to a lot of players, you know, myself included sometimes. Okay. It's Do you have a, a list of must listen to drummers for uh, young players? Well, Mel Lewis is one of my absolute idols. I think mm -hmm. he swings in big band drummers, like a, about two categories. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mel Lewis for sure, and I love Buddy Rich. I always love Buddy Rich. And, uh, a gene, he's like one of the, you know, you can pick out the, uh, the geniuses like uh, Oscar Peterson on the piano or and Buddy, like people who do, and Art Tatum who could play what nobody will ever be able to mm -hmm. duplicate what these people have done, and he's one of, one of, one of those. Um, I love Jeff Hamilton right now, who's a, a drummer from Los Angeles, one of my favorite players. Dennis McCrell, I think, is a great drummer. Uh -huh. And uh, I love all the Joe Jones and all the great drummers with the Basie bands. I mean, I have a really long listening list I make uh -huh. all my students take. And you got to listen to at least one, go find one of these records. And if I have a small group playing, I love Philly Joe Jones. Oh, he's probably one yeah. of my favorite players. Yeah, and I, you know, Elvin Jones, and the, I just, there's a, the list is endless. <laughs> What's the IAJE? Um, do they have a mission to increase the audience for jazz as well as the players? They do have a mission statement, but I don't have it memorized. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I, I would think that that would be a really, really important aspect of education that I actually, now that you're mentioning it, find it kind of missing from from what they're what they're doing and I think that would be a really important thing for them to yeah. take on you know and and a lot of that comes comes from the artists too you know you, you it's so it, it, this is the other funny part it makes me laugh you get out of school you have all these chops and you're a great player and then like I said you know you go to the audience and the audience wants to hear take the A train again for the 20 millionth time <laughs> yeah. in their life they don't want to hear your new song that's the coolest <laughs> harmony in the world right. they want to hear take the A train and they want to hear it straight ahead and so that's always finding the balance right. <laughs> like to keep the audiences interested and right. that's something I mean when I was in school I wrote the Outest music. I, you know, made mm -hmm. all these recordings with my friends, and we, you know, we thought that, oh, this is so hip. This is great. We're gonna, we're gonna be it. This is happening. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Could you play "Take the A Train," please? I've like, uh, yeah. so. often wondered what would happen at one of these jazz parties if mm -hmm. somebody announced, "Okay, now we're gonna do an original composition." Yeah. <laughs> well, we have that in, in, in five play our quintet here. Uh -huh. We have some, you know, different kind Good of for arrangements. You. That, but you just, yeah. we can't. We, you know, we, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do it. And the, the. Uh -huh. The other thing that, even though musicians are artists, and they, they certainly are, but you have to remember the, the only, only reason you're on the stage is because there's an audience mm -hmm. there. They paid money to see you. You owe them something, you know? And, it's, and you know, they, the audience would owe us respect to present them something that, that mm -hmm. they like, but you have, to know where you're, you have to know where you're going, you know, and gauge your program towards that. And I love playing Take the A Train, and I love just, Swinging, and I love playing stuff that's a little weirder too. Mm -hmm. But you just have to know who you're playing for, you know, and, and hope not to. It's like that's the business part. You have to you have to pay attention to it. Right. And I think, yeah, I don't know how to educate audiences to, you know, you must like this new kind of harmony, <laughs> you know, or yeah. that kind of thing. Like to get 
people to like that because the diversity between a festival like this and, and some of the, well now you can't even really count some of the festivals as jazz festivals because the headliners will be James Brown and Earth, Wind and Fire yeah. and you know, things that have nothing to do with jazz at all. But they've become more just big music festivals just mm -hmm. to keep the crowd interested. And I, again, it's a whole trickle down system of what the record company and the media promotes and what people hear on the radio all the time. If people, if there were more jazz stations, and I mean, some like my nieces and nephews, they never would hear jazz if they didn't come to my, every time I see them at my concerts and they're falling asleep by the third song, but they, you know, they don't even have a chance to hear it. Like if it was in people's right. faces more, if there, mm -hmm. you drove by and saw a billboard with the Count Basie band instead of, uh, you know, Rick, uh, Ricky Martin or something. Yes. You know, if it was, if people were just aware of it more, then mm -hmm. I think they might have an interest in seeing the, yeah. the concerts. Well, you know, jazz, I think takes some work to listen to. Mm -hmm. I think it's not as easily accessible to people's ears somehow. They don't, a lot of people don't understand. Uh, they say, oh, I like jazz until they stop playing the melody. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't quite know how to listen to it, and I'm not sure that they really should. It's, uh, it also boils down to the way that it's, it's presented also, and the, and the artist, you know, like, uh, someone who I idolize with their stage presence and something I was always trying to learn from people who are great band leaders and understand what I mean you can warm up to somebody really fast even you can really like someone even if you're not a hundred percent convinced you like the music they're mm -hmm. playing like Clark is so open and so warm and he's just so I mean you he's it's like he just walks out and gives the audience a big hug or something right. and he you know his style he does a lot of original tunes but they're and it's sort of stylized so people will like be comfortable with what the feel his group plays with. They don't play anything crazy or play free or sound right. like an, like the drums are falling down a flight of stairs or anything. <laughs> you know, they, they, he, but he does a lot of original music and his yeah. his group is and Flip Flip Phillips who mm -hmm. was here last year who just played so great played a lot of we played a lot of original stuff. Uh, 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 music he wrote on Sweet Georgia Brown on those chord changes and oh. we, we play one of his songs based on I Got Rhythm that's called The Claw and mm -hmm. we played it yesterday and the audience loved it but th they don't know that song they could never sing that song that's a song yeah. as a really fast bebop head uh -huh. that would be like alien to an audience like this but you know it was Flip Phillips and it's, it's straight ahead swing and maybe mm -hmm. they recognize the I Got Rhythm chord changes I don't know but there's right. you know there's ways to do it and, and to present it yeah. and find a, find a combination that's not doesn't make it so difficult and if you know if you have the art a lot of jazz jazz musicians are you know my friend used to say yeah isn't it weird jazz jazz musicians think jazz is an open wound let's pour salt in it we just have to suffer you know and be all like you know suffering for our art because this is the blues and it's like mm-hmm yeah right go no I don't <laughs> think so and they look so serious and like you know a lot of mm -hmm. artists are so introverted and, and, and so like just into their you know art I'm an artist I'm you know I'm gonna be as weird as possible and alienate you and turn my back to you mm -hmm. you know and it's like yeah no it's not it's not fun you know I like to have fun when I mm -hmm. when I play and I always do so I hope and I think the audience reacts to that right. also other than you know then they get they get scared if you're all serious and, and dark and mm -hmm. crazy acting and they're like <laughs> Ooh, what are we listening to you know you could play Take the A-Train with a weird attitude and scare yeah. people, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I, I love it when people do creative things, even with the... Someone last night was doing uh, Grab Your Coat and Grab Your Hat. Did, like sunny Side of the Sunny Street. Sunny Side of the Street. Mm -hmm. And they were playing it in two keys. Yeah, you see an E-flat. Yeah, going back. And I couldn't figure out what was going on for a minute. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, I thought I knew what song this was. And then it shifted, and I'm going... That <laughs> was really neat. Yeah, Wasn't neat. Um, your tenor player playing in that set, I think? Yeah, I know. Yeah, that was good. No, and an interesting thing, since you mentioned a knot, is uh, also what I'm finding really fascinating is, well, I'm the, I'm the only American in my quintet, first <laughs> of all. The women in, in Diva are w literally women from, from all over the world. Uh -huh. and that's, that's really fascinating also how yeah. our, our alto player, Carolina Strassmeyer, comes from Bad Mittendorf, Austria. This little tiny village, her, her dad mm. is like a forest ranger. Or they live in the, you know, like how the, how the wow. heck did she come out playing like uh, unbelievable jazz player? She's a genius, a brilliant player. And it, this, like the impact of, of music and a knot from Israel and mm -hmm. Nikki and uh, our bass player, Nikki's sister, Lisa, all they're from Australia. Nikki plays Barry Sachs in our big band. And we have, um, 
rhythm section player is two players from Japan, and uh, we've got a girl from Italy playing tenor sax with us, and people, just women from all over that are, I think that's Now see, amazing. if that's interesting. If, if, mm -hmm. if this was an all, an all guy band, mm -hmm. and you had those same nationalities, they would probably promote it as an international type band. Yeah. But you've got that, I mean, you've got two kinds of interesting uh, identities to your band. It's, it's, it's great. But, but I, you know, I, 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 I was in a position when I first started uh, playing and recording, and I, I mentioned that I, about Michael Moore, and he mm -hmm. was, actually, I did get a chance to play with him on a CD. I would never hire a woman, ever. It didn't even occur to me to hire a woman when I first started <laughs> like doing my own projects mm -hmm. and I was actually in grad school met one of my my boyfriend John and we're not together now but we, mm -hmm. he was a great alto player we did a lot of uh, two CDs together did some recording never would even have occurred to me for any reason to hire a woman I mean nobody mentioned it we're just like let's just get these players we like yeah and there wasn't even a, a woman that even would have come to my mind at all you know which is interesting and even and even so, I would have been skeptical, just because I, and I think a lot of, I don't know if women will admit it, but I, you know, admit my ignorance to thinking, I, I had the stereotype too, and I, I was, um, I was not like, I was different than the stereotype, so, you know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. serious, and I'm, a, I want to be a really good player, and I'm not going to be one of those TNA women with the lipstick and short skirt trying to play jazz, bad, you know, play the <laughs> sad version of In the Mood to make $200 in my miniskirt. No. So I was, uh, I, you know, to me, it was, whenever I heard all-woman band, I was always like, Pfft, you know, sure. You know, so, I mean, I, I became enlightened of myself, and, and right. I also found, though, that it, like in the big band, there's 15 players. It, we are extremely lucky if there's one substitute for every chair. Yeah. Just because the, the quality of the band is so high and they're, Aren't yeah. enough women to fill the chairs that play, when the, oh. and you go from the level of, the level of what what the professional players in diva, and then like one notch down. I mean, the gap is like this. It goes oh. professional, very student. Oh. There's not like too much of a trickle up. Mm -hmm. It's either you're really really good, and you're you've taken it seriously, and or else you're you're in a, at a student level. And mm -hmm. where with with men, it's easy to call, easy to call like 20 people right off yeah. the bat that are all equally qualified. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a that's a problem. Well, uh, I'm going to ask you the question about you're on a desert island <laughs> and you can take five CDs <laughs> or LPs. Okay. Oh, well, look, actually, I'll tell you that in a second. But what I was going to tell you, I'm sorry, I got off my my track with the, the not hiring women and stuff. But yeah. now, like with with Diva and, and Five Play, I don't know if it's it's the people that I because I work with them all the time anyway, but. Like our bass player, Nick, I used to have this uh, incredible fantasy. I always wanted to play a shuffle with Ray Brown. It was like, I love mm -hmm. Ray Brown. But now, I mean, I, I love playing with Nikki. I mean, I think she's one of the best bass players I know. And now it just becomes a matter of, you no, know, there's just certain players. It, I don't, it doesn't matter that Nikki's a, a woman or a man or whatever she is. She's just my favorite, like one of my absolute favorite bass players. So now you have, uh, you know, wider, wider choices that, yeah. you know, and, and for me it's kind of, Neat because I don't I don't have to think, oh you know the women women thing again because it it's it never yeah. never occurs to me like it never occurred to me before to hire a woman now it never occurs to me to to worry like oh should I hire a man should I hire a I mean it, that I never think of that I just think who okay. do I like and I'm lucky now that I'm not so I'm more, much more enlightened than I was. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my five CDs. <laughs> I would take a Buddy Rich compilation CD okay. or his Big Swing Face album, <clears throat> oh, yeah. which I love. I would take uh, one of my Mel Lewis albums. I have to think about which one to take. Probably the one with Groove Merchant on it. Mm -hmm. Mel Lewis. I'd probably take. Uh, I I can't tell you this. I have I have to whittle down my list, but I'd take a Ray Brown trio album with Jeff Hamilton and Gene Harris on it. Okay. Uh, Probably an Oscar Peterson trio album, and maybe uh, probably a Frank Sinatra record, okay. or Ella Fitzgerald. I don't know. I, have right. to, I need more time to prepare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Only five? That's not mm -hmm. enough. That's not enough. Yeah. Well, this has really been a fascinating conversation. I, oh, good. I wish you all the best in the, <laughs> in the future. Um, and uh, you going on tour? Coming up with any of your groups soon? Yep, we're booking a tour with Nancy Wilson. 
actually with the big band. And All uh, right. our first concert is going to be in, at the Tanglewood Jazz Weekend. It's Labor Day. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're doing our fourth CD in May, a live CD. We're doing five days with Diana Shore at the uh, Manchester Craftsman's Guild, which is a phenomenal place in Pittsburgh. Uh -huh. Like very state-of-the-art audio video recital hall. It's amazing, wow. amazing place. And um, we're going to record our half all five half of our concert and hopefully we'll get one good live CD out of it. <laughs> right. Yeah, so that's our two big projects coming uh -huh. up. Well, I, I uh, wish you luck in, in all that juggling. Thanks. I think it's a, a good role model for people that there's lots of different ways to make a living in music. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to do all of them, I guess. Yeah, but with, with the performance aspect, though, we're we're really lucky but to have to have Stanley. Like, no, no mm -hmm. kidding. I mean, like I was, we could have a million big bands, but you have to have. He really knows the business part very well, and mm -hmm. he was willing to invest a lot of his money to get us rolling. I mean, we commission all of our own music. You know, we play all of our music is original to to, uh -huh. to us, both the small group and the big band. And yeah. Just with our PR person, Virginia Wicks, and Pete, you know, it's a big, ex big expense, and he's he's invested a lot, and you know, it's, he's like a, a little angel for us. So mm -hmm. we're lucky for that. Great. Well, thanks for your time today. You're welcome. Thank Appreciate you. It.